Amen. All right, so here in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we see the story of David, you know, bringing the ark back to the city of David. And he does, he's bringing the ark back, and Uzzah is, you know, killed, of course. This is a story that I've always read in the Bible, and I always thought was, you know, when I, especially the first few times I read the Bible, I thought, man, that was kind of harsh that, that that happened. You know, they basically, they put the ark on this cart, and they moved it. They were moving it towards the city, and, you know, it was going to fall off the cart, and, you know, he puts his hand on it to stop it from falling, and, of course, the Lord kills him. So, this morning on Mother's Day, I want to preach a sermon to you. Um, the title of the sermon is called The Case for the Biblical Mother, and I want to show you this morning, I want to give you three points for following God's plan, and following God's plan, you know, in, in many parts of your life is important, um, of course, according to the Bible. But this morning we're going to focus on motherhood. I want to give you three points on just the case for the biblical model of a mother and the importance of following this model. So today, in this country today, you know, we have basically the world telling us one thing and the Bible telling us another thing. I don't know if you've ever heard um, this, this term used before. It's called, you know, the term called the mommy wars out there and basically it's this it's this debate it's this strife between um, this is used to describe the strife between you know the working mother and you know the stay-at-home mother in this country now the mommy wars according to the Bible and according to our beliefs if you think that this is an actual war the the mommy wars are actually being lost in this country all right, because you know, stay-at-home moms. It's it's considered to be a stay-at-home mom today is considered a social demotion in in our society, and nothing angers me more than that because nothing is further from the truth. It's really what it is is this battle between feminism and what the Bible says that the traditional role of women in the family should be. I mean, I've dealt with this myself in, in the workforce, seeing women in the workforce. I've had people say all sorts of things to me when they, when they find out that my wife stays at home um, with our children. Because this is one thing that even before I was saved, this is one thing that we got right right away. My wife and I, before we even got married, we had decided that when we did have children that um, she was going to stay home and raise our children. And that was just something that, you know, thank God we had right from the beginning. All right. So I've had people say to me, you know, especially women in the workforce, you know, what does your wife do all day? You know, I mean, I could just never do that, they say. Like, you know, they're super smart and my wife is this moron that can just stay home and, and raise our kids because she's, you know, intellectually not there or something like this. Right. I would just go crazy if I stayed home all day, you know, things like this. Like, just very rude things. But the bottom line is the world today is pushing women everywhere away from motherhood. And really, if you think about it, they're pushing women away from motherhood and towards manhood in many ways. All right? If you do have children, you know, you're supposed to, you're just expected to take them straight from the hospital to daycare. Motherhood to the world today is basically maternity leave. That's it. And then from there, you're to just go into this world and compete with men. That's what, that's what feminism is teaching, has taught women today. You know, they're teaching women, hey, you can do everything a man can do. You know, whether that's true or not, is that God's plan? Is what we're going to talk about today. You must compete with men, women today are told. You must make more money than men. As if this is our goal in life, is to make money. You know, you must shun marriage. You must shun motherhood. You must, you know, these things are designed by a patriarchal society to just keep you down. This is what women, girls are taught today by the public school system, by daycares, by society in general, especially the university system. You must go to college. You must get a career. You must put off marriage and having children until you're 40, which that's not going to work out. We know that, right? You don't have to be a doctor to know that. It doesn't even make any sense. Feminism is a lie, and it's bad for women. Okay? I, I'm not going to go off on fe feminism, but I mean, look, it's bad for women. It's bad for society. 
Feminism has given us wonderful things in this country like abortion, like legalized abortion, like, you know, gay marriage. These are the things that, that feminism has given to our country. Declining marriage rates, you know, skyrocketing STD rates. You want to talk about a pandemic in this country? Go look up some stats on STDs in this country. That's a pandemic, a real one. Men, look, and then men, men don't need to get married anymore. Think about this. If you're a man and you have no religious convictions, there is absolutely no reason for you to get married. None. Because it used to be that for men to have access to a relationship with a woman, they would need to be, they would need to get married. When things were traditional and more moral in this country. Now, look, any woman will move in with any man. He, any man, I mean, look, I, I had a friend who we both graduated from college together and started our careers at the same time. He stayed single, I got married right away. And I remember talking to him five, six years after um, we had been into our careers, and, you know, he, he was very successful, and, you know, I, I was having kids and, you know, starting to raise a family. And he's like, I, I would never get married. You know, it's just nothing. He's not a, he was not a, you know, religiously convicted person. Why would he ever get married? It's just risk for him. That's it. He, I mean, he had no shortage of, you know, relationships with women. Why would he ever get married? That, I mean, that's what he would tell people. Why would I ever do that? If you don't have any religious convictions, there's no reason to do it in today's society. That's what feminism is. Feminism has enabled the whoremonger in this country. That's bad for women. That is bad for women everywhere. Why people can't figure this out is unbelievable to me. So this morning, I just want to give you three points and give you the case, the case for biblical motherhood. And it's the opposite of what the feminized, the feminist society will tell you. All right? We must stick to the Bible way as Christians. It's not enough to just, you know, give it lip service and say, yeah, I agree with that. In cases of especially motherhood, you must stick to the Bible way. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 6. Let's read the first few verses of 2 Samuel chapter 6. And I want to show you the importance of God's model. Because God has a model for everything in the Bible. Anything that is important to you in your life, God has a model. And you better take it seriously or there will be serious consequences. Look down at 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Again, again David gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark, in front of the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on the manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps, and on psalteries, and timbrels, and coronets, and cymbals. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. So here we see that David is doing a good thing, first of all. He's bringing the ark back home. David is doing a good thing. His heart is in the right place. So this is important to notice, too. It's not that David was you know, doing something bad, or he had, you know, ulterior motives, and God was after him because of this. As a matter of fact, even Uzzah, the man that died, what, where was his heart? His heart was right, too. He was simply trying to stop, the, they put the ark on this cart, and he was simply trying to stop the ark from, I mean, this holy piece of, of history for Israel, he was trying to stop it from falling on the ground. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter where your heart is because God insists our methods matter. Our methods matter. 
There was very specific instruction in the Bible that all of these men knew on how to transport the ark with the rings and the staves and who was to carry the ark, who was to touch the holy things. If you're not a Levite, you better not touch the holy things or you would die, the Bible says. There's a very specific model. It's not like God left it up to interpretation. There was very specific methods that were to be employed here, and it didn't matter that their heart was in the right place. Good. So look, veering from God's plan will never go well for you, Amen. Amen. no matter where your heart is. Look, it's no different with motherhood. It's no different at all. You say, because look, most mothers, I mean, how many mothers will you find out there that will say, you know what, I just don't love my kids? That's why I'm not going to stay home with my kids. All mothers, are, their heart is in the right place. But the methods are wrong. And the methods matter. So you better stick to the plan. Turn to Jonah chapter 1. We'll look at another, um, another example of someone going against God's plan. Against God's plan. Jonah chapter 1. Look down at Jonah chapter 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He's running away from God. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was mighty tempests in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, the people on the ship, and cried every man to his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Everyone to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? They're like, Who are you? And whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am in Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. So Jonah knew God's plan. God literally came to Jonah and said, I want you to do this, and he ran away from it. He ran away from God's plan. He... he didn't want to do it. And how did it work for him? You know, he gets swallowed by the whale, and he finally, you know, gives in to God's plan. So look, knowing God's plan and fleeing from it will be a disaster for you. So what is God's blueprint for mothers? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. God has a plan for motherhood. It's very clear. It's very specific. And it must be followed or there will be consequences. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 and look down at verse number 14. The Bible says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So it says that the women are, these women are supposed to marry, have children, and guide the house. So what does it mean? The question is, what does it mean to, you know, guide the house? the house. I mean, does that really mean that I can't have a job, that I can't work, you know, when I'm, you know, when I'm a mother, when I have children? Well, let me ask you this question. Do your kids need to be guided from 8 o'clock in the morning when they wake up to 5 o'clock in the afternoon? Do they need to be guided? Or can a two, three, four-year-old just kind of guide themselves? Can they just kind of handle things on their own? No, someone obviously needs to guide them. And that is what the Bible is talking about here, is that it is the mother's job to guide the home. The guide, I mean, that's why the, the, the words before guide the house said bear children. Guide the house means guide the children, is what it means. 
right? I mean, look, a child left to himself. Yeah. Look, someone needs to guide the children. They need guidance. And the Bible says that it's your job, Mom, to guide the children. You know how many things that, um, you know, I, I was thinking about this when I wrote this sermon, but we're all about multitasking today, right? Everybody's got a hundred different things to do, and you always have to be planning all these different things, especially if you work and have a family or if you homeschool and all these things. But do you know how many things that you can do well at one time? How many things, and look, this is proven. This is scientifically proven. I don't care if people say I can multitask like nobody's ever seen. The, hu uh, the human mind, a human being, can do one thing well at a time. Period. So if you're constantly doing five things at once, that means that you're going to do a subpar job at most of those things. And look, that's true for me, it's true for you, it's true for everybody. Right? You can only do one thing well at a time. And, you know, this is, uh, the focus should be on the children. So whoever is guiding the children, that needs to be their main focus. And the Bible says it's the mother that is supposed to do it. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. But wait, there's more. So, I mean, guide the home. That means you're there to guide the children. What does that mean? What does that mean? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 7. A verse that I'm sure many of you know well. The Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is talking about the importance of the law, the importance of God's Word. And the Bible in verse number 7 of Deuteronomy chapter 6 says this, And thou shalt teach them diligently the laws of God unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest, Rises up. Look, it says, from morning until evening, you are to guide your children in the law. Who's going to do that? The Bible says it's the mother that has to do that. That's her job. That's the model. Look, you can't lead if you are not present. I don't know how many times I've seen this mistake made from parenting to in the secular world. You cannot be a leader if you're not there. It's impossible. Many people have tried it, and they will fail every time. It works for the military. It works for management in situations. It works for small projects. It works for big projects. If you're not there, you can't lead. Period. It will not be effective. This is the engineer that engineers something and will never go out in the field. And will never go and look at the people that are building what he is. He'll be a horrible engineer. He'll, be, he'll fail at his job. But the man who is present, the woman who is present there, teaching these, these children, guiding the house, you have to be there. I'm sorry. You have to be there. You have to be present. Now look, women know this. Women know this. I've seen it over and over and over again. They're, they're, as soon as women, even that are in the, work por in the workforce, have children, you can see their conscience take over. They don't like it. They don't like, you know, putting their kids in daycare. They don't like dropping their children off. They know, look, the, the law is written in all of our hearts. Amen. They know it's wrong. I've seen it again and again and again. But the thing is, you can shut your conscience off. You can, you, can listen to, you can listen to women who have already successfully done that, and you can suppress that, con that conscience that you have that God has given you. You can do it. It's possible. It's possible to sear your conscience, even in this area. It, it's, like, it's like, you know, drinking buddies. Think of it that way. It's the same thing. They're just all validating their sin together. That's, that's the only reason that they're friends. Guys that go out and just, you know, drink alcohol and get drunk together. They're just sitting there validating each other. They, they could care less about each other. They're just validating each other's sins. It's the same thing. You can sear your conscience in this way. But the biblical model for a mother is that she is to be present. She is to guide. She is to teach. She is to talk. She is to talk with her children. Think about how important just conversations, you know, with with a mother. I, look, I stayed home for, I was home, I'm, I'm not home anymore, but I was home for about three weeks. 
And, you know, I know that my wife is busy. I know that she does these things. But one thing that really struck me was just the conversations that they would have throughout the day about things. Mom, what about this? Mom, what about that? And just the conversations that strike up. And the nice thing is, is the older your kids get, as they're learning the law, and as they're getting wiser and wiser, those conversations just get more and more interesting. It gets more and more rewarding, more and more fun. So they are there to talk and learn the law and just have conversations with their mother. Okay? The second point I want to make today on the biblical model of motherhood is who is to make the primary investment in the children? The investment is the second point I want to make. Now look, this is majorly misunderstood today. You will hear people today that will not have children and not want to have, now obviously they're not Christians, but they're just like, oh, we can't have children. It's just too expensive. We just don't have the money for it right now. I mean, there's studies out there that say like each child's going to cost you like $300,000 before they get to be the age of 18. I'm like, first of all, I can tell you that's not true. Because <laughs> I've never had any kind of money like that. And, you know, my kids haven't starved to death so far. So the point is that the investment into your children is completely misunderstood by the world. The type of investment that is needed. Look, the investment is not money into children. It's time. It's love. It's guidance. Turn to Proverbs chapter 29. I want to explain something from the Bible that I've always wondered why this, you know, I used to wonder why this always popped up this way until, you know, my kids grew up and I kind of started to see some of these things. And just like the Bible always plays out to be true, no matter what. And it's just amazing. This is one of those times that has just kind of been enlightened to me in the last few years of my life. Look at Proverbs 29 and verse number 15. The Bible says this. I'll wait for you to get there. Proverbs 29 and verse number 15. The Bible says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. So, why is it, the question is, why is it that this is a child that's been just left to themselves, they've gone astray, they're, they're doing bad things, they've, I don't know, whatever, but it says it brings his mother to shame. Why the mother? Why is the mother pointed out here? I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to explain to you why, but I'm telling you, it, that's exactly true. That's exactly true. So why is it? The one thing I've noticed is whenever you see a child gone astray, first of all, especially an older child that goes astray. Say someone has a 20-something-year-old child and they've just, you know, maybe they're Christian parents and their child has gone astray. It is the mother who is devastated by it. I'm not saying the father doesn't care, but the mother is crushed by it. All right? I can tell you, I mean, I'm going to confess some sins to you here this morning. My kids aren't perfect. My kids have made mistakes before. And when you have a child that makes, you know, say a larger mistake or they, they do something that's bad, look, the, the, the mother is the one who is who's devastated. How could they have done this? I, I thought that, you know, they would have never done that and they would have made this decision. And the, the man, you know, is just like, how do I fix this problem right now? Where does the hammer need to be dropped? That's what the man thinks. But the woman, the mother, takes it personally. And here's why. Because it was her primary investment. Because she is the one that invested the time and the love. So she takes it personally. And she should. She should take it personally. And you see, you'll see that. But the man's reaction is much more you know, black and white. How can I fix this problem? How can I solve this problem? But, but with the women is, you know, did I raise them right? Was I a proper lawgiver? And because they are, they'll take it personally because they are the ones that did the majority of the teaching. Okay, it makes perfect sense. They put in that investment. You see this again and again and again. Because forget the $300,000. That's not the investment that's needed. It, it's the law giving. 
It's the time. It's, you know, whether they, they were taught, you know. So, look, enjoy that career. You know, go far. Make, look, because look, here's the thing, women. You can get out. Look, women are smart. This isn't anti-woman. Look, women, you, you can go out in the world and you can make more money than your male counterpart. You can do it. It's possible. I've seen it. You can become the boss of everybody. You can become the CEO. You can become the, the king of, or the queen of the company or whatever. You can have that career, but get ready for the shame because it's coming. Because if you don't follow this model, the Bible says it's you that will bear the shame. Get ready for it. So it's not a matter of whether, it's not a matter of whether you can do it or not. And the saddest thing is when you see the 50 or 55 year old woman, you know, realize this when they're 55. That's the saddest thing. But get it ready. Look, you can become everyone's boss, but get ready to endure shame when it comes to your children because that's what's coming. And I've seen that a dozen times. It plays out every time. The Bible's true, whether you like it or not. Amen. Go to Proverbs 31. Go to Proverbs 31. Look at verse number 27. That pesky Bible will get you every time because it's going to work this way whether you like it or not. Look at Proverbs 31 and verse 27. The Bible says, She looketh, this is of course the virtuous woman passage. We've studied this. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. There's that pesky household again. So she will bear the shame. Why? Because the primary investment was done by her or was supposed to have been done by her. That's God's plan. That is God's plan. So what does she do all day? Turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, look at verse number 8. And then keep your place in Proverbs 31. We're going to go back and read the first part of Proverbs 31 and, and, and look at something interesting about Proverbs 31 that is rarely brought up. And I'm not sure why, but um, it's just rarely brought up. But look at Proverbs 1 and verse number 8. The Bible says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Once again, the mother is the lawgiver. She is the one from morning to night teaching the law to her children. Talking, teaching. Go to Proverbs 31. The virtuous woman chapter in the Bible. Proverbs 31, look at verse number 1. And the Bible says, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son, and what the son of thy womb, what the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways that destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. She goes into drinking. And she goes into, uh, you know, drinking. And then the whole... Re so basically, Proverbs 31, the, the passage of the virtuous woman, is King Solomon's mother teaching him the law. It's what he learned from his mother. And she's talking to him about drinking. She's talking to him about, you know, who to marry. She's talking to him about all these what? These details. These, Because look, it's all about the details, folks. It's all about the details and everything that you do. If you round corners, it's, it's never going to work out. So we see that, you know, the mother has to follow the biblical model and that the mother has to make the primary investment just like King Solomon's mother did with him. And we get this. The, the greatest chapter in the Bible on what a woman is supposed to be like was taught to King Solomon to him by his mother. Great wisdom that she imparted to him. The third thing I want to bring up, turn to James chapter 4. Turn to James chapter 4. The third thing I want to bring up is about the biblical model of motherhood is that time is to be spent by her. So we see it's the model in general. It's the investment in what she's supposed to be doing. But it is going to take 
time, and time needs to be invested. Look at James 4 and verse number 13, 14. The Bible says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the, on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. Look, that's a, this is a great passage in the Bible. I'd love to read more of it and, and just study this passage. But the bottom line is, is that you don't know how much time you have on this earth, so be careful how you spend it, first of all. And even the time that you have with your children will go very fast. So get on this program that you're supposed to be on and execute it and forget about the money because you can't go back and get it right. You can't go back. And it goes so fast. I have no idea how my kids grew up so fast. I think about it and I, I, I can't even imagine how it, it, it went so fast. You will never get this time back. So don't be like, hey, uh, I'm gonna, we'll get this right you know, in a year or two. No, you won't. You have to get it right now. Or you will pay for it. Your kids will grow up so fast. Look, I'm constantly, I'm like in panic mode right now. Like with my family. Because I'm constantly searching for things to do as a family together. Because I see those times coming to an end. Where we will all be together. So I'm like, you know, let's get in the car and let's go visit somewhere. Let's go um, knock on the Perry's door during the pandemic. And they're like, well, you know, I don't know. I want to do that. Get in the car. We're going on a family trip. It's going to be fun. I'm doing that a lot lately. And the reason I'm doing it is because, look, I'm panicking. I can see it coming to an end for me. It stinks, right? Don't, look, you can't get time back with your kids. You get this right right now. You just listen to me. Just get it right now. You know the plan and just execute it. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 14. Second Samuel chapter 14, look at verse number 14. Once again it says, For we must needs die. And are as water spilt on the ground, we cannot be gathered up, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person. Yet doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. So look, God doesn't, God's not going to make it work for you because you're you if you don't follow the plan. You're like, well, you know, we're special and we can still make... No! It's going to go the same way it went for Uzzah. Uzzah's heart was in the right place. If you don't get with the program, get on the program, and execute said program, it's not going to go well. God's not a respecter of persons. He's not a respecter of your family. He's, he's given you the plan, and if you don't follow it, you know, he just killed Uzzah. And you're reading that in the Bible, and you're just like, man, he's just trying to stop it from following. Falling. It doesn't matter. So look, people are making this wrong decision all the time. You know, it's actually sad to see so many people making the, sam the, the, the wrong decision. All these unsaved people, I, I've watched it again. It's like, a, it's like a bad movie replaying over and over for me. As you're out in the world, the secular world, you see these people. They're not bad people. You know, they're not bad people. They're just, they want to go out. They want to work hard. They want to raise some decent kids. They want to love their wife and love their kids. And they're just making the same de decisions that everybody else is making. And they're, they're losing their kids over and over and over and over again. And they don't like it. They don't like it. They don't like seeing their, their kids turn into drunks. And their kids turn into potheads. And their kids turn into whores and whoremongers and committing fornication and moving in with all these other guys or girls or whatever. They hate it! But that's how it's going to go! And I see it again and again and again. And eventually, these unsaved people, they, they just get used to it. And it's like, oh, that, that's just how it goes. That's just how it goes. But when it starts, when they're 14, 15 years old, that's where it always starts with all of them. They hate it. And they come to me, I, I can't believe they're doing this. What do you think about this? I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't deal with that kind of problem. You want to know why? No, no, no. I just want to complain. If you don't follow the plan, it's going to go a certain way. Period. 
Look, and if you're not, if you you have no Christian tendencies whatsoever, you're not saved. You don't follow the Bible. It's real easy to follow the world on this one. Because look, it's just a monetary decision. It's real simple. I would love to have double the money that I have right now. That would that would make some things easier in my life. But no, it wouldn't. It would be a disaster if I did that. A total disaster. So look. Why, why is, let's, let's look at this in conclusion. Why is there a war? Why is there this mommy war going on? You ever think about that? Well, I mean, why do working moms, why do they care? You know, why have all these people over the years said all these horribly rude things to me and these rude things to my wife? I mean, people have told my wife, oh, you know, you've just wasted your education. People have said that to my wife on multiple occasions. First of all, you can never share your Christian views with people with the same, you know, just audacity that people will share their stupid views with you. That's just a general rule. I don't know why it works that way. It's probably the devil. But uh, you just, I just feel like you just wasted your education. Look, first of all, no real education is wasted, ever. No real education is wasted. No actual Bible-based education is ever a waste. Period. That's the first thing. We're all just this brainwashed into this university system is, is ridiculous. You know, don't and, and don't listen to my preaching against the wicked university system and think that I'm not for education. Because I am for education. I am just not, you know. My wife is incredibly educated. Because of this, it, you know, by the time, because of this fact, by the time that ch my children leave my house, they will be incredibly educated. That's what she does all day, is she educates the children. She guides the house. So that's the answer to, I don't know what I would do all day. Well, you know, you would teach your children. You would instruct them. It's because these people that say that type of thing, they just don't understand the model. They don't know that there is a model. They don't know how to move the ark. Period. God's given instructions. There's plenty to do. It's like, it's like these people that don't know what a mother that would stay home and guide her, her children biblically, it's like they're walk, they have a bike that comes in a box and it's got like 40 pieces to it. And they're just carrying this bag around with all these parts. And they're like, this is my bike. You like my bike? Because they don't know that, you know, there's instructions to put the bike together so it can function. And it can, it can carry itself and you and, and, and function the way that God has designed it to function. There's instructions. You know, this is my bicycle, this box of parts. That's what people think. You know, but the problem is this, it's not, even, it's not even really a good analogy, right? It's funny thinking about carrying a box of parts around, but it's not a good analogy. You know why? Because when it comes to your kids, someone's going to put it together. You're not going to be walking around with a bag of parts your whole life because somebody is going to come along and they're going to assemble the parts for you. And you don't want to know how they're going to put it together. They're going to put it together backwards and upside down, and it's not going to work, and it's going to, you know, kill people and endanger people, and I mean, it's, it's a dangerous thing. But it's not a bike, it's your children. For crying out loud, other people are going to assemble them for you. If you don't fill out that, that chalkboard, someone else is going to write on it. So this is something that can't be a defensive thing, Christian. This can't be defense. You don't win a game by playing defense. You have to be on the offense. But look, the reason there's a war, back to the point, the reason there's a war is because by sacrificing so much yourself in the world's eyes, people will be offended by it. You will offend people. It will demonstrate to others the importance of what you're doing and what they are neglecting. That's why there's a war. General rule. You will be surprised as you start getting things right 
How many people think that they have control over what you do once you start getting things right? And you say, well, you know, that's never happened to me. Well, maybe you should try getting some things right. And it will happen to you. So look, mothers are so important. And I believe this from my head to my toes. My wife's role in my family, my wife's influence on the children is more important than what I do every day. My wife has, the, uh, the biblical mother has so much importance in the family, it just angers me beyond all get out to think of all this attitude that is put you know, in this demoting these people socially, demoting the stay-at-home mom socially. It, nothing angers me more. Because nothing is further from the truth. The mother in the family has the most influence on the children. And her influence and her guidance and her law giving is make or break in the family. That's important. That's more important than me going and getting a paycheck. That's more important than you know, just you know, supporting my family, which I'm supposed to do. But that mother's role cannot be underestimated. And it will be rewarded with joy or shame, depending on the decisions that you make now. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for uh, all these mothers, Lord. I pray that um, you just give them wisdom and that they can guide their children, Lord. I thank you for the role that you have, you have outlined for, um, for mothers, for the safety and the well-being and the growth of the Christian child, Lord. I thank you for this perfect model. And I just ask that you just give us strength and courage to just forget about everything that this stupid, wicked world says. Just have us read the Bible, know what your model is, and just follow that, that model, Lord. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for these blueprints for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.